Welcome to Monday Night Live. My name is Brendan Malone and on this episode I'm going to be speaking to Leighton Baker. Leighton has been involved in the New Zealand political scene for about 10 years now and he is the head of the new Conservative Party. At the age of 23 he started his own building business and he's worked in all areas of that industry including training young people for the building trade. He's the married father of four grown children and he's also an adoring grandfather. In his politics he promotes personal responsibility, limited government, free markets, individual liberty, strong national identity and protection of family values. Without any further ado, let's watch the interview with Leighton Baker, head of the new Conservative Party. Leighton, thanks so much for being with us here this evening to talk about the new Conservative Party. Before we get into the questions I had pre-prepared, we are recording this today on Tuesday the 14th of July and what a tumultuous few days it has been. Um, Todd Muller has just resigned a few hours ago as the leader of the National Party. Do you think that this puts the new Conservatives in perhaps a bit of a stronger position going into this election? I absolutely do. Uh, the reason for that is there are a lot of Conservative voters throughout New Zealand who have always voted National who are looking at that party going, actually, these guys do not represent what they used to. And they're wondering, who do we vote for now? And we've seen that travelling up and down the country. And with Todd Muller, who, who was this reasonably conservative type of man leaving, who's going to be the new leader? And will they be conservative? Will they be liberal? And the high chance they'll be even more liberal, which means there's less opportunity for conservatives to have a voice within the National Party, and people will be looking. And the second thing is National are looking less and less likely to actually get in or even be any real threat at this general election, which means more and more people will be able to look at uh, smaller parties that represent their views without uh, fear of actually changing the outcome of the election. Tell me, uh, you've had a pretty tumultuous weekend. There was a hit piece that appeared in the media about the new Conservatives. We'll come back to some specific questions about that, but it seems that you are being noticed. Yeah, yeah, they obviously were a bit scared of us. I mean, I spent an hour with the young lady reporter in there. They put about 30 seconds of the interview up and then the rest of it was all just slime and nonsense from around the place. So, yes, we are putting the wind up their sails a wee bit. They don't really want people speaking common sense and practicality by the sound of it uh, in Parliament, but we're going to keep plugging away. Tell us, before we get into the specific political questions, because I've got a few of them for you about the party and your policies, yeah. uh, how would you describe Leighton Baker the man and, and why did you get into politics? Look, I'm a, I'm a tradie at heart. I'm a builder by trade. I really enjoy it. I enjoy mixing and mingling with people. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. Uh, I've got my own businesses that I enjoy running. We've got a little bit of land. We've got blueberries. I see myself as your average Kiwi bloke. I enjoy hunting, uh, fishing. I do a bit of motorsports. I'm not any good at them, but I just enjoy the freedom to be able to try them. And I think most New Zealanders do. And that's a beautiful thing about this nation. And I got involved in politics where I saw threats to our democracy and the fact that there were very vocal, small, small minorities taking us down a path that I don't think will work. Uh, building's all about problem solving. That's all you do all day, every day. And so all this is about looking at the choices that's being made for us as a nation. What is the end result for those? If that outcome is not good, why are we heading down there? And that's the challenges we're bringing up in the political scope. Well, one thing I'd have to say as someone who's a bit of a train spotter of politics, it is quite impressive how the party had such a major uh, hurdle with what happened with Craig. And then yeah. now you have really seemed to have revived and there's a, it seems there's a new energy and a, and a very invigorated party out the other side of this now. Yeah, and we always believed that. We knew last election was going to be an absolute slaughterhouse, and it was. But that's all part of pushing through. So the media were just doing the negative campaign the whole time, continually putting up photos of, of Mr Craig, which he wasn't even involved in it, uh, just smearing us the whole time. We knew we'd have to push through, which we did. But what we see now is a massive amount of energy that I've never seen even even in the Conservative Party days because it's all grassroots based. I mean, candidates from up the far north down to Invercargill working really, really hard, doing all the leaflet deliveries by hand, putting all the signs up themselves. So there's no big money, there's no big funder. It's just everybody doing a little bit, which is fantastic. 
loving it. Are you frustrated by the fact that it seems to me when I look at the media side of things that uh, they are still really treating this almost like it's a first-past-the-post election with a couple of secondary support parties and they're ignoring largely the minor parties who really should be given a voice to actually, I guess, to push their wares and to try and earn the vote, if you like. Yeah, it is, it's, it's not by accident. You've just got to look at how this whole structure works in New Zealand. So there's a few things. One, that the funding from the Electoral Commission, you'll be well aware that our political parties can't advertise on TV or radio apart from using Electoral Commission funding, and the, the Electoral Commission gives that funding, allocates how much you get. So the big parties are getting about 1.2, 1.4 million each, and we're getting 62,000, so that's all we're allowed to spend on advertising. So automatically, the two large parties are put in front of the people of New Zealand uh, you know, 20 times more than we are. So automatically we're made to look tiny. And then when it comes to the leaders' debate, years ago, uh, Peter Dunn was in a leaders' debate, so they had all the leaders debating together. He made a bit of common sense, and they had a worm, and the worm turned and, and showed favour to that. his party, and he got eight MPs in. So after that, National and Labour both said, we will not debate with minor party leaders. They didn't like being made look like idiots. And so... Unfortunately for us in New Zealand, our media is controlled by the government. And so the media, instead of saying, well, we're having a leaders debate. If you don't want to come, that's your choice. They said, OK, we'll do two. So what they do now is they have a leaders debate with National Labour, which is a serious debate. Then the minor party uh, leaders debate is almost a teddy bear's picnic. So it's made to look frivolous, uh, foolish, uh, insignificant. And so the, the subliminal message given to the people in New Zealand is there are only two parties that are really serious and everyone else is just mucking around. And and so that really does control what happens in New Zealand in regards to our political process. I want to ask you some specific policy-related questions in just a second, but one of the common uh, retorts, if you like, you hear from voters is they say, I don't want to waste my vote. Ha ha what would you say to someone who looks at the smaller parties and then has that panic moment and thinks, oh, I better vote for, vote for one of the big boys instead? <laughs> Look what you get. Look what you get. How many people wasted their vote last election because they didn't vote what they truly believed? They thought they were strategically voting. And actually they voted for something they didn't want. They got what they didn't want. And now they're upset by it. So you wasted voters when you don't vote for what you believe. Yeah. And I think the big call this election is don't vote to get someone out. I mean, that's something I hear everywhere. Oh, we need to get so-and-so out. No, it's not about voting someone out. It's voting the people in that you think will truly represent you. Because yes. when you vote someone out, all you do is leave a void. And who's going to fill it? You don't know because you've only voted someone out. But actually target and vote people in that you really believe hold your values and, and it will represent those for you in Parliament. That's the key. That's, that's what an excellent point. And it's something I've been saying for a while now is that you don't simply vote against something. You, that's the worst way to do it. Fear-based voting is, is atrocious. You've got to vote based on principle, I think. Um, yep. Tell me, uh, over the weekend there was this hit piece uh, that targeted the party. We've mentioned it already. One of the things they really accused you of or laid it on thick was this idea that somehow you were connected to the Trump movement and other things like that. Now, regardless of what individual people in the, in the party might feel about the president of the US, you don't have affiliations to Trump or anything like that, do you? You're your own New Zealand entity, right? I've got nothing to do with anyone in the US. Uh, it's just so funny, isn't it? They, they just pulled mud from everywhere. I mean, I have to laugh. It's just so much uh, smoke and mirrors. And, and I guess that's why our mainstream media are really struggling is because no longer are they presenting the truth for you and I to decide. They are presenting a narrative that they've already decided and they're telling you must agree with us. And I think the people in New Zealand are getting wise to that, that we're being manipulated and controlled by a, a small-minded, prejudiced media. So with that in mind, let's get down to brass tacks then. How would you describe the politics, the, the position of new Conservatives in a, a sentence or two? What is it, what's the ethos of the party if people are going to vote for you? In a sentence, we want to make people important again. Uh, and that makes, needs a bit of elaborating. But when it comes to taxes, we want taxpayers important again. When, when the government spends $572,000 on a slide and it's 45% over budget and they think that's OK, that's actually a poke in the eye to taxpayers. So we want taxpayers important. We want voters important again. We've had citizens initiate a referenda for, what, 30-odd years, never been binding. No government has ever honoured one. So... The government, you know, even if they get less than 50% of the vote, they say, oh, we have a mandate to rule. But actually, when 90% of the voters say, we want this, they say, no, we're not listening to you. How is that democracy? And in fact, that's why I got involved in politics in the first place. That's not democratic. So we want the voters important again. We want our farmers important again. They grow great food. They've been villainised by the media. They've made to feel like they're the pariahs of society when actually 
all of us love eating. Well, I do. And, and they really they do a fantastic job. The food they produce is some of the best in the world. We don't need to be condemning them. We need to be supporting them and helping them overcome the challenges. So it is that thing. Of how do we make our young people important again? Well, not by legalising dope. That'll destroy them. How do we make our trades important again? By encouraging early trade training, trade schools from year nine. Because we want our toilets to flush. We want our lights to work. We want our car to start in the morning. Everyone rushed off for a haircut after lockdown. So make our trades important again. So that's the ethos of the party. We just want the people of New Zealand feeling like they're important, they have a value in society, and they have a future. Okay, so economic policy. Are there any sort of standout points that the party represents? Because that's a common one people talk about. What is your sort of economic ethos? What are some of the key policies you're pushing there? So on taxation, it's the first 20,000 tax-free. Uh, for married couples, it's income splitting. So if there's one, one spouse is working, they can split the income with the other for tax reasons. So if you were earning 80 grand, uh, you and your spouse could split that 40 grand each. Because you get 20,000 tax-free each, your first 40,000 of income is tax-free. And the ethos behind that is we believe the taxpayer is better suited to spend their money than the, than the government. So on taxation, that's the key part of it, and then changing the tax rates, but uh, that's all on our site. We believe in using the resources we've got. Uh, Finland is the richest, I think one of the richest nations in the world per head of population. And because they use their resources, we don't. So we, we say, oh, we're not exploring for uh, hydrocarbons because they're dirty and we're clean, but we buy it in from overseas. So we're not clean. We're hypocrites. And so we say, if we're going to use it, use ours. Yeah. Because all we do is send money offshore to use someone else's, and it's the same with coal. You know, this coal is the most efficient way of, of for use in, our, in creating energy in our milk plants, etc., schools, hospitals. Use our coal instead of importing it. Our coal is some of the purest in the world. Use ours. If we're not going to use it, that's a totally different story. But if we're using the resources, use our resources because that provides jobs for New Zealanders, provides income for us as a nation, and stops us sending money offshore. It's just it's reasonably common sense. F family policy. I notice you've got uh, someone who represents a, a portfolio around uh, Oranga Tamariki, so I'm assuming you've got some points there. But family policy and, 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 and uh, issues around family, you talk about family values. What are some of the practicals there? Yeah, I think you look at the really big picture there. What are the causes of most of the grief that we see in New Zealand at the moment? So, for instance, uh, in our justice system, most people that are incarcerated, in fact, virtually everyone that's incarcerated in New Zealand comes from a broken home. Uh, so if you're going to deal with, with reducing prison population, you have to deal with that issue of broken relationships. And so we've devalued the family in New Zealand. We've said the family aren't important. They don't actually matter. You can have whatever sort of family you want, and they're the same, but they're not. Because deep down in every child's heart, they desire to be brought up with a mum and a dad in a loving relationship. And mums and dads um, parent differently. I, I'm, I don't know your situation, but I've got four children and five grandchildren, and, and we parent differently, we grandparent differently, but also those children respond differently. So you need uh, both flavours working together. So we believe it's time that as a nation we started valuing the family. I think in the 1970s, if you were a Māori child, you, there was an 80% chance that you'd be born into a mum and, born into a mum and dad family. Now that's down at 20%. That's massive. And then when we look at that, and then the parallel look to what's happening within our justice systems, with teen suicides, with all those things, it is the breakdown in the family. So the best thing we can actually do for New Zealand is encourage and strengthen families. And we can do that by... Uh, making it more equitable with, <clears throat> sorry, with benefits and superannuation. We can incentivise it with income splitting. Uh, we can reduce tax rates. We can adopt some of the policies from other nations where they've encouraged families to get married, stay married, by providing low interest or free loans uh, for people that do that, simply because families are important and we need to do that. Uh, we've got a controversial policy that people have been throwing a bit of mud us, at us about, and, and that's around young solo mums. Um, but the DPB was born for good reason, to look after young solo mums. But the outcome of it has been negative because so many of those children are the ones that are getting abused by these guys that come in as predators and, and take advantage of the situation these young mums find themselves in. So at some stage as a community, we have to look at how we protect these young mums and give them the skills that they need and then changing circumstances by keeping them free from predators and protecting the children from abuse. OK, so... Tell me then, that, that policy has attracted a bit of controversy. How yep. do you deal with or how do you respond to that issue as a party? Because there are obviously always going to be young women or older yep. women who fall through the cracks in that situation. How do you not pull the rug out from underneath them, but at the same time perhaps 
address what you see clearly as, as being a problem area? Well, it's not pulling the rug. What we've done is we've partially, the DPB has partially supported them. It's supported them with, with um, fiscal support or, or uh, like a house and some income, some benefit. But it hasn't supported them in regards to being a parent and being a mother and their socialisation and increasing the education or getting work skills. That support isn't there. So basically those young mums are isolated and left vulnerable. We're saying it's not worked. Uh, you know, if you continue to do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. We've got to change it. So we are suggesting you have motel style arrangements where you might get 12 of these young mums together, have an older couple there. Uh, those young mums can have the socialisation together without abandoning their children. But they can be taught uh, parenting skills. They can be allowed to increase the education, finish trading, training, get job skills. But at the same time, those young children are also protected from predators. And the young children, you know, there can be a play centre there. They're interacting with other kids. To me, that's a much more holistic way to support and protect those young mums. What we're doing now isn't. We've set them up for failure, and when they fail, we go, oh, my goodness, how'd that happen? So we, we've got to change things. Yeah. A bit like superannuation. You know, the reality is we cannot afford super to carry on the way it is. It's impossible. As a nation, we just haven't got the money. It's, it's going to fall over. So at some stage, the government needs to recognise that and say, actually, we have to change it because we cannot. It's fiscally impossible for us to carry on the way we're going. Okay, and, and superannuation, what would your, have you got proposals or ideas around how that might look if, if you were able to be given a blank check on that? Uh, yeah, well, it's not so much a blank check. It's about changing the way we do things. So it's about encouraging people to save for their own retirement. At the moment, the people that are working now are paying for the retirement of those that have previously worked. So we're saying, actually, let's incentivise people to actually save for their own retirement so they're more in control of their future, uh, which is a fairer way to go. So it is a transition thing. There's no silver bullets, and often in New Zealand we're very, very uh, short-term focused. So we make policies and decisions looking for a quick outcome, but actually what's gone wrong has taken decades. To fix it will take decades. We just need to start on the right path. So there is going to have to be a, a very gradual but incremental increase to the retirement age, but also allowing people still to get out their KiwiSaver at 65 if they've been in a job, which means that they, they actually cannot carry, carry on working. So hard physical labour, you may need to get out your retirement earlier. But generally, increase net age and then increase your KiwiSaver contributions. The government actually contributing where people can't put as much in as they'd like to. So instead of putting a blanket check over everybody, actually targeting the funds to where need is most, so that when people retire, they have got that fund there available for them to, to live the life that they feel that they need after they retire. You've mentioned farming, you've mentioned coal. Obviously, the environmental thing is sort of the big issue of the day for everyone. Yeah. What, what, how would you describe the new conservative uh, ethos around uh, environmental policies and issues? Yeah, I think the key thing is we all love New Zealand, don't we? And we want to look after the nation. We want to look after its wildlife. Uh, we, love, we love getting out in the bush and enjoying what we have around us. What we say is the, the three-odd billion dollars we're throwing away every year on carbon credits does not help our environment. In fact, if New Zealand went zero carbon tomorrow, it would not change the world environment one little bit. So that's just poor governance, right? And we're one of the few nations that have the whole emissions trading scheme. We're one of the few nations, we're tiny, we're actually reasonably clean, and yet we're throwing all our industries under the bus. We're increasing the cost of all the basics, food, transport, all of those is being increased for something that will not make any difference. That's poor governance. So we're saying actually target funds on specific pollution solutions and on specific areas where we can make a difference. Let's put money aside for research and development, target for specific solutions, so uh, cleaning up waterways, getting rid of nitrogen, and then encourage better farming practices. We can do that. We're doing it. Farmers work really hard already. Uh, they've done 30,000 kilometres of fencing. They've paid for themselves. Six million native plants planted themselves, so encouraging that sort of behaviour. But target the actual pollution, come up with solutions, and export the solutions. That's how we can really positively affect the world. Throwing billions of dollars overseas for no benefit is actually poor governance. We'd, we, we'd get out of the Paris Accord, do away with the ETS. No, no, planting pine trees is fine for the value of the pine, but incentivising international companies to own massive amounts of New Zealand land on the increasing value of carbon credits is not good for New Zealand. It really isn't. And what it'll leave is massive amounts of land covered in pine forests that aren't going to get harvested. It, it, it's not good. The long, so long term, it doesn't work. Okay, so you, you, you're saying that we, we need to take a more, what, a more prudent, uh, pragmatic approach to these environmental concerns. Is that, is that 
would that be the general consensus? Absolutely. We need to look at reality rather than the hypotheses. And, and let's be brutally honest. You know, 10 years ago, we were all going to be drowning and dying, and it has not happened, not even remotely. So, you know, we continue to say, oh, we're all going to drown, we're all going to die, but it's not true. We're putting fear onto young people. You know, there's heaps of scientists coming out saying, actually, we were misled. What's happening isn't what we said would happen hasn't happened. So we've got to actually be brutally honest and say, OK, we were lied to, we were deceived. We do need to look after the environment. We do need to stop polluting it. But the whole carbon credit thing, and when you look at it, the guys that went and signed the article in Doha flew there in something like 1,500 private jets. You know, are oh, we going to save the environment? Really? I'm sorry, the, their actions say they don't believe it one little bit. They're still buying property on the beachfronts. So the, the reality is the people that are pushing it are making lots of money and they're taking it off the everyday people that work, and I don't think that's right. Okay, so you've mentioned young people. Education's obviously a, a, another area where people always ask about. Um, mm. Do you have any specific um, targeted policies around education, either tertiary or schooling for younger kids, or perhaps even just an ethos about that in general? Yeah, we do. So one of our key things is actually trade training from year nine, because I, I spent six and a half years working with young people that had dropped out of the education system. And, and they were the, you know, the rat bags, the kids that were smoking dope and playing up and tagging. And so what we did is we put a tool belt on them and we did really practical jobs. They built houses, sheds, barns, etc. And what we found is 95% success rate. Because we said to those young people who didn't enjoy school and sitting down rote learning wasn't them, and so they felt they had no purpose. We said to them, you've got a purpose. New Zealand needs you. You're actually really important. And by doing that, they thought, oh, we are. And it made a huge difference in their lives. So trade training at year nine is a couple of things. One, it will reduce crime because young people kept in education will commit less crime. But two, it will actually allow us to have a more vibrant, uh, more advanced trade sector, which we need. We want smart people in the trades. There's a really interesting chart that came out about two years ago and it itemised your income by your occupation. And it actually had those in construction above lawyers. Yeah. And we failed to tell that to young people. We've said to them, you only go to the trades if you're an absolute dropout. But we don't. We actually want the people with skills and now creative thinkers, problem solvers, those that will come up with new techniques of doing things. We want them in the trades because the trades are essential. Healthcare? Yeah. Healthcare is a... Is a, is a uh, we, we, we've got a, a situation in New Zealand now where all of our DHBs are in the red, uh, the healthcare concerns are pressing. We've got what some call the grey tsunami, that, that wave of older retirees who require a lot more of healthcare resources, which is just normal, it's part of life. But yeah. what do you have uh, policies, approaches in that arena? Absolutely. So healthcare, we need to treat a little bit like retirement. Uh, when you're young and fit, you don't need the doctor very often, um, unless you're useless at sports and you keep getting injured like myself. But generally, generally people stay away from the doctor when they're young and fit. And so if we have a, a system where you're actually saving for your health care, you're getting a health budget that comes to you, it goes into a, an almost like a savings account for you that you can grow, it grows and grows, and then you can use it as you get older and you need it. It gives people a bit more freedom and a bit more choice with their health care. At the same time, we've got to look at options in New Zealand that detract from health. Uh, poorly built homes, cold homes, what, the, what happens with that is every dollar you spend making a house warmer and drier, you save about $3 in the health budget. So... Actually improving our housing stock is really important for health. And then not doing things that will be detrimental. So if we legalise THC in New Zealand, we will have an increased health burden. It's not a, it's not a dream, it's not a falsity. That's just the reality experienced everywhere. You have an increased health burden, particularly in mental health, more road accidents. So legalising THC will actually be detrimental to our health system because it will put more burden on them. So it's, it's a combination of doing things that are really good and not doing things that are stupid. And then also allowing people to have more choice with their health care. So it seems to me that then, if I'm hearing this right, you're saying take that more holistic approach where the, the person is viewed in the context of their actions and wider society and, and that all focus, that focus helps you to sort of improve health care outcomes. Yeah, well, it's, nothing's isolated, is it? Everything has an equal and opposite reaction somewhere. So we have to look and consider what, what, what's tended to happen with government is they say, oh, here's an issue, let's throw a whole lot of money at it and solve the issue. But it doesn't solve the issue because it hasn't addressed the cause. A, a classic example of school lunches, the idea sounds really good. We, we give kids school lunches because if they're hungry, they won't learn. I get that. But by giving them the school lunches, we haven't addressed why have they not got lunch. Yeah. So we haven't sent anyone around to the house. So, so we don't know if it's because there's drug abuse in the home or there's been a breakup in the family or um, the, the wage earners actually got sick or whether they've died. 
We don't know whether there's gangs come in or they've got under financial stress. We don't know why that child isn't getting We don't know if they're just selling it on the way to school to buy some ciggies. Okay? We have no idea. And because we have no idea, we haven't addressed the issue. And so that child that doesn't get lunch at school will not get it in the weekends and will not get it in the holidays, and we haven't addressed the actual core issue is why they're not being looked after. So it's really it's looking at the bigger picture because when we address the core issue, then the outcomes will be better and save us as a community a lot of grief and money in the long term. Okay, so let's talk about now law and order then. Um, I, I'm clearly hearing that uh, the cannabis referendum, you, you're, you're a staunch keep keep it as it is. It's by the sounds of it, what I'm hearing. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Like legalising it, has, there's only the only benefit for legalising it is um, big business will make a lot of money. That's the only benefit. No one in New Zealand is locked up for smoking a joint. Nobody. Um, so it's a bit of a... There's a few lies being spread at the moment. The reality is, if you legalise cannabis, more people will use it, more harm. I don't know what's going to happen to employers like myself where people come under the influence, do stupid things. I have to pay for it. I have to fix it. It's my fault, even though it's them doing it. What happens when it's legal? I've got no recourse. So it's, it's a bum steer every way. Our deputy leader, who's worked on the streets with young people for about 15 years, he heard from a friend in Colorado. He said, the good news, Elliot, the good news, if they legalise cannabis, you and I will be employed for the rest of our lives because the harm to young people is massive. Now, what else in your law and order portfolio do you think is is sort of uh, your, your key policy areas in this regard? <laughs> well, it comes down to education as well. We're saying let's concentrate on relationship training in schools. Yep. We, we, our health syllabus is too much focused on sex. Sex is one part of one of your relationships, but it's not a key in all your relationships. I have relationships with suppliers and sub-trades. Uh, sex is not any part of any of those, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what are the key parts for a healthy relationship? We need to teach about communication, commitment, common interest, and self-sacrifice, because every healthy relationship is a wee bit of self-sacrifice. So it's actually, that's the first part of your justice system, is actually teaching people how to build, maintain, and develop healthy relationships. Sure. Uh, the second part for us is trade training, because that keeps young people involved in education. The third part is tra- um Youth farms, so that's getting young people already in the justice system, breaking the connection they have, taking them somewhere totally different for a year, letting them find out what uh, alternative lifestyle is all about, growing their own crops, dealing with stock and animals, learning different skills. But the big thing is you're breaking the connection, the cycle they're already in. So, so you're getting you're getting them out of the prison system. Is that what you're saying? You don't want them oh, these are young that. people that these yeah. are young people that are not in the prison system, but they're yeah. in the justice system. Okay. So the police yeah. know about them. They've been picked up and dropped off, picked up and dropped off, picked yeah. up and dropped off, etc. So the young people aren't in prison, you know, yep. but it's getting those young offenders that will be going to prison. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yep. And so that will, won't work for all of them, but it will work for some. And that policy is developed by uh, one of our board members who's had 400 of, of, of such hardest core offenders through their home. So they know what they're talking about. Yep. After that, we, we get to the three-stage sentencing. And with our justice policy, what I, like, I liken it to uh, a race on a sheep farm. Whereas the sheep come down the race, you can screen off uh, the ewe lambs, the ram lambs, and the ewes. And it's the same thing. We're trying to divert people from crime as much as we can. But for those that find themselves incarcerated, we say three-stage prison sentencing. The first stage is you must engage and work in prison. So you can't just sit there and do nothing. The second stage is every prisoner gets an individualised education programme. And what that's about is there's a lot of prisoners who have fetal alcohol syndrome or dyslexia. They haven't got even basic math and literacy, numeracy actually give them those, but the, the thing for it is you're making them responsible to achieve it. So it's unfortunate for a lot of these people, other people have everything, done everything for them, they actually have to achieve it. And until they achieve it, they don't move to stage three, which is open prison. And that's where they're working outside of the prison during the day. They're rubbing shoulders with people that aren't incarcerated, because too often our prisoners are incarcerated the whole time. When they're let out, it's a totally foreign culture. Yeah. And it's scary for them, they'd rather be back inside where it's safe. So. Actually, when they're rubbing shoulders with, you know, this guy's going to touch rugby on Wednesday with his kids and, and this lady here is going fishing in the weekend and this family here is going um, to Rarotonga tomorrow when the, when the bubble's extended uh, for a holiday. So they have a vision and inspiration of aspiration of what they can do. They're meeting other people. They're also getting skills that will be able to use when they get out. So what it is is we as a community are doing everything we can to help them rehabilitate well, but we're actually putting the onus on them to want to. If they choose that they don't want to, then they don't get out. That's their choice, and we'll honour that choice. Yeah. So then they're not allowed to be let out to reoffend, but we'll do everything we can to help them rehabilitate well. So I, I was going to say, this is a very rehabilitative um, process that you've, that, you know, this policy. It's, and, and it seems to have been uh, 
quite well considered in that regard. Yeah, well, I mean, make people important again. We want to make the victims of crime important, but we want we want those that have found themselves in a life of crime to have an opportunity to enjoy the New Zealand we do. But for that, they need to change their attitude from being a victim themselves, and it's not their fault, to understanding that they've got to take responsibility, that they can change their outcomes, that they can make a positive difference, and that they can be valuable to society. So it, it's looking at both, and it is really important. It's giving them the opportunities, but also putting the responsibility on them. And that's the only way rehabilitation will really work. Okay, so there's always a, a question that pops up around election time, and that is uh, the question of sentencing and sentencing lengths and minimum sentences and things like that. Do you have a policy around sentencing at all? I think our three stages takes care of that because, yeah, yeah your sentences have to reflect the crime. Um, and just giving people lighter sentences because we don't want full prisons is stupid. So we need a, a long-term approach, which is, you know, good training, giving them the opportunities, but making them responsible. So, yeah, the sentencing becomes secondary after that. OK, we've had a couple of contentious issues this election cycle. You've already alluded to the fact of people voted last time thinking they were going to get sort of different outcomes when we asked the question about a wasted vote. Uh, now we have a very serious likelihood that euthanasia is going to be passed into law. We've had a very extreme abortion law that has been enacted uh, yep. under this term of government. What, what, what's your uh, approach on abortion and on euthanasia? The abortion law, the very, I mean, the scariest thing about that is they've taken the human rights off the unborn and even the born. So they've taken the human rights of children. And every New Zealander should be worried about that because when any government... The government's role is really just to protect the nation and encourage and enable them to succeed. That's its real role in a democratic society. But when the government decides that it is going to take the human rights off a sector of society, then who's next? And that's my huge concern. You know, we all know that a baby, really, apart from taking a lung full of air, is no different the day before it's born to the day after it's born. It, it's the same baby. It's got the same eyes, ears, the same brain, everything. It just hasn't taken a lung full of air yet. But what this government has said is even if it is born alive, it is not allowed to get any medical help. So that that's appalling. That's disgusting. And it is totally... The worst thing is they passed it under urgency while we were in lockdown. Yeah. So but this government has been appalling at following democratic process. They've basically pushed through their agendas. doesn't matter what the people in New Zealand say, they've pushed through their agendas. It, the cannabis thing, they're funding the Drug Foundation. The Drug Foundation are putting massive ads in the main papers and on television promoting a yes vote. So the government are paying for the yes vote. Yeah. That's appalling because it, there's no benefit to New Zealand. If they're going to pay for that, they should pay for to people telling the truth about what will really happen if you legalise it. And then when it comes to euthanasia, you know, again, we have the highest teenage suicide stats in the world. And why does anyone take their life? They take their life because they don't see it worth living anymore. Life is too hard. Now, euthanasia is saying, if life is too hard for you because of sickness, you may take your life. But the only difference is because of sickness. But for everyone else, they're saying, no, you don't. Well, you can't have that mixed messages. And I, I spoke a bit earlier to you about self-sacrifice. I think but euthanasia is one of those areas where those that are terminally ill and in pain need to understand that their right to take their life needs to be given away for the good of the whole, for the yeah. good of the rest of the nation and for the good of the vulnerable. And, I mean, you and I, we're sort of not spring chickens anymore. We've probably watched people die, had family members die. We want people to die well, to be well looked after. But actually saying to them, you can take your own lives. If life's not worth living, that is a very bad message for us to give to anybody. Tell me, do you have any, uh, a lot of minor parties talk about their bottom lines or, or policies around some of these more controversial issues. Uh, do you have uh, th uh, policies or, or bottom lines around either of those two issues? The euthanasia is a referenda. So yeah. that's up to the people of New Zealand. And, and we are the party of binding referenda. We want referenda to be binding. Yeah. Uh, we've got safeguards around it, which you probably don't want to spend all day talking about. With, you know, But at the end of the day, politicians are simply chosen to represent us. They're not chosen to rule over us or dictate to us or control us, but to represent us. And so binding referenda allows us to control those politicians and say, actually, you're going the wrong way. So euthanasia and cannabis, we've got a referenda. People need to get out there, get informed and vote. On the abortion issue, we said we just can't support any party that, that will allow this to continue without it going back to the people and actually having proper frank discussion because what they've done is actually wrong. Uh, we can't support that legislation. Okay, so let's get into perhaps some of the more 
maybe well, quote unquote controversial issues depends on on where you sit i suppose but uh one of them you've mentioned binding referenda uh, it seems that for some people that is a bit of a sticking point can you give us just a, a quick summary of why you think that is a, a sensible policy to have it's a sensible policy because at the moment 62 politicians can choose which way new zealand goes and they say that the wisdom of five million new zealanders is not greater than the wisdom of the 62. however to be a politician, you don't need a degree, you don't need a diploma, you don't need a trade, you don't even need level one NCEA credits. So if you say, no, the people shouldn't choose, the politicians are chosen to choose, you're trusting people that you have no idea of their skills, their ability, their experience to tell you what is wise. Yeah. That's actually really foolish. It never happened in business. So we're saying the people should choose. And we've got safeguards around it. If, at the moment, to get a referendum is too hard. That's why they don't happen very often. It's just too hard. So we're saying make it 5% of the people that voted in the last election yeah. to get support your question. Then it goes to the vote, but it has to have two-thirds support. Now, no prime minister and no government in New Zealand has ever had two-thirds support. So the threshold is very, very high for the questions. It's not like it can be 50-51 and be manipulated. It is very, very clear. So our binding referendum policy gives power back to the people and allows us to control a government when they're going a little bit rampant. Okay, I, I've, I would have to say that I, me personally, I'm, I'm not a, I certainly haven't been a fan of the idea of binding referenda. However, in the last two years, having seen up close and personal the political system on a couple of major issues and, and been in the House and watched as MPs haven't even turned up to vote on essential clauses and very important bills, and they've just given their vote by proxy to someone else, all of a sudden I'm thinking, okay, maybe we're not actually getting the, the, the promise of, of MPs who are dedicated and focused and actually voting prudently is, is, is beautiful, but it seems to me we're not actually getting that at the moment. However, how do you uh, avoid the excess of, say, frivolous referenda, uh, people targeting anything or holding up a government and stopping it from progressing by saying, well, we didn't like that particular tax policy or we didn't like that particular minor policy, so we're going to get a whole lot of signatures and, and have a referenda? Um, if you've ever been involved in giving signatures, you know that's never, ever going to happen. So for the referenda that have already happened, often they've had to get an extension of time, taken 18 months to actually get enough signatures to force one. Even when the Green Party were, were behind a referenda, they had to get an extension of time. So, yeah, that's an argument put out. It's just not even real. It, it's, um, it doesn't exist. And you won't get the signatures for a frivolous referenda. Getting people to sign... So for the, we're talking about referendums that had 90% support. 90% still took 18 months to get enough signatures. Yeah. So if you've got a frivolous one, you're never going to get the signatures. Never going to happen. And then because we're saying two-thirds support in the vote, if it's frivolous, it still won't get supported, even if somehow you got the signatures. So the safeguards are there to stop that. And the reality is, if it was binding, hopefully we'd never have to use it. Yeah. When referenda was brought in, the CIO was brought in, the government basically said we don't need to make it right binding because no government would ignore the wishes of the people. But, you know, no government has ever honoured a sins initiated referenda, never, ever, yeah. even with 90% support. That's disgusting, actually. And a democracy, that's appalling. So it, it, seems, it seems to me that, that, that really what you're saying is that it's a mechanism of accountability and it's rather than, rather than direct governance by the people all the time, it's for, for the people to actually correct, course correct. Absolutely. We're not talking about direct democracy. We're not talking about direct democracy where we have a referendum on every little issue. Absolutely not. It's an opportunity for the people of New Zealand to call the government to account when they're going off task. OK, so uh, another issue that, that crops up from time to time is the, the issue of Māori seats, um, Hobson's pledge, things like that. Yeah. I've heard mixed messages about where, where new conservatives stand on that. What, what's your policy in those areas? Yeah, I think I'll start off by saying what's our key thing? We want people to be important again. We want Māori to be important again too. It's really, it's, it's intrinsic for us as a nation, you know. Mm. It's an important agreement we have in the Waitangi, um, with our Waitangi Treaty. It's very important. But what we see in New Zealand is Māori are failing more and more. There's, there's, the success isn't there. So with all the payouts to all the iwis, Māori are not succeeding. They're actually going, their outcomes are getting worse and worse. So do we carry on down the same path? which is failing, or do we change what we're doing? So as a party, we're saying there's a couple of different issues. One, there's the justice issue. So while Māori have had land taken or stolen from them or have donated it and then it's been repurposed and they've never been given reparation, that's a justice issue and must be dealt with in the justice segment. And the sovereignty issue, we firmly believe that, all, that there's no way I believe that the Queen would have signed a paper allowing two different governing bodies within one nation under her rule. It never would have happened. And I think the evidence from uh, the... the 
um, council in 1860 in Koamarama showed quite clearly the chiefs understood that sovereignty had been passed over to the Queen. And the reason they'd signed it over is because they saw the issues that were happening in New Zealand and they wanted the rights of British citizens, which was the right to own land, not to be at war anymore. So not to have to fight for your protection of your land, no longer warring between tribes to hold your land because you owned it as of a right. Um, a right a right to actually be able to choose Parliament and discuss and be involved in that. In fact, that's why the Māori sects were introduced, because there was some sneaky stuff going on. Our white man was being a bit dirty, and he was excluding Māori by bringing in rules like, oh, you can't vote unless you own land. And because yeah. Māori were co-owners of land, they couldn't comply, so they couldn't vote. And it was just dirty tricks like that. So the Māori sects were there to give Māori a voice, which it did do. And I think if you look at New Zealand at the moment, in Parliament, we have a great representation of Māori and not necessarily, in, and the Māori Party aren't even in Parliament. Yeah. So Māori are well represented, but I don't think any nation can move ahead with two totally different uh, areas of sovereignty and, and rules. It doesn't work. We've all got to actually be under the same rule of law. And then when it comes to benefit and aid, we believe it should always, always be targeted at need. Not on your ethnicity, not at your gender, not at your age. Apart from superannuation, which is obviously age-related, but everything else should be based on need. So how, how then do you ensure, again, in the process of, of perhaps what you see as writing, uh, correcting the, the ship a little bit, how, how do you ensure that, say, Māori representation is not lost as, you know, as, as in an ongoing way in governance in New Zealand? Well, I don't think it will be lost because it, it isn't lost at the moment. Māori, without the Māori seats, there's plenty of Māori that still vote in the general seats and we still have Māori members of every party in New Zealand. Yeah. So Māori are part of society. They are part of who we are. And I think if we stop this whole divisive thing, I think generally people in New Zealand get on really well. I mean, in the trades, I have Māori people come on site all the time. I work with them, sub-trades, tradies, whatever. We all get on. There's no problem. There's no issues there. There's people driving wedges in, and, and there's been incredible amounts of money spent that hasn't benefited the actual local iwi. And so there's people making a lot of money on, on dissension and, and sticking wedges in between people, whereas each year as a nation, we get on really well together. So I think we need to stop the divisiveness and actually people will accept each other a lot more. I think when people are pushing for that divisiveness, what happens is other people get really upset because they see injustices happening. And so I think actually for New Zealand to heal, we need to actually deal with the justice issues, but then understand we are all the same under the law. I think it's good for us as a nation. It's healing for us as a nation. It will take that, that stress that we see out. In fact, it's interesting when we see a whole lot of the South African immigrants who have come to New Zealand they're saying, man, we had to leave South Africa because of the divisiveness there and the angst there and the hatred there. We don't want to see that happening in New Zealand. OK, so another controversial policy of late, really since March last year, has been the firearms question. Can yep. you just clarify, because obviously there's lots of accusations flying around about new conservatives and firearms. What, what is your policy position on that particular issue? Really, it's around democracy again. So the government, so one guy... So let's get this straight. One person from Australia came to New Zealand, they got their licence, and, and from all accounts, they shouldn't have got their licence, OK? From all accounts. But they got it. They managed to get arms, and they went and they created, com committed a horrendous act, OK? Absolutely, totally agree with that. But the government, within two weeks, passed a raft of legislation without consultation, without due to democratic process. And those laws cost us millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, and tens of thousands of police hours with police actually watching law-abiding citizens hand in their legally owned firearms. Not the gangs. They weren't targeting crime. They weren't targeting gangs. The government forced them to focus on law-abiding citizens. That's poor governance. So what we've said, hey, look, that whole process should have been dealt with correctly through a true democratic process, proper hearings, and actually coming up with a law that didn't actually cost us hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of police hours. And there's all sorts of ways it could have happened. Um, just even changing the category of the firearms, putting more regulations around them, so maybe you have to be assessed twice a year, or you've got to belong to a firearms club, or I've got to be locked in a steel safe, whatever. But actually, a resolution could have been found that didn't cost us anything, but the government rushed through law and cost us massive amounts. And the unintended consequences are out there as well. So we're just saying it's really poor democratic process that was forced through on an ideal. Yeah. Well, ideology, that's not right. That's not how New Zealand should operate. Do you have a view to perhaps uh, rolling back or adjusting any of that policy if, if you are yeah, able absolutely. to? absolutely. Yeah. Roll it back and put it through the proper process. Come up yeah. with something that New Zealanders want and will work. Yeah. Listening to the people that are affected. 
because it's an emotional thing. So the government got it through on emotions. Oh, these terrible firearms. Well, no, it was the firearms that one guy used. The firearms themselves don't do anything. It's that one guy used it, and he didn't go through the proper process. So if he'd been through the proper process, it never would have happened. So what the government didn't do is sit down and listen to all affected parties and find out who has them, why they have them, should they be here. But instead, they used a motion to get back up to force through a law that actually was unneeded, unnecessary, and is poorly written. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing for, because for me, it's uh, it stands as a stark contrast to a government. For example, if you look at say euthanasia or cannabis, they're acting in the exact opposite way. They're saying that they believe now that you can have certain harmful things in the community, and and as long as you're law-abiding, you'll be fine. Well, when it came to guns, though, they took the exact opposite approach and said, no, 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 it's it's too unsafe, even for law-abiding people. It's funny how the government announced they're going to take a 20 percent pay cut under COVID, but they haven't been able to get it through yet. But they put the farms through in two weeks. Yeah. Oh, it takes time to do this. It's very, very complicated, you know. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And and the other classic is well, not classic because it's terrible, but this young boy in Napier who was so severely abused that he was going to die or be brain dead. So he's been released from the hospital. He is brain. He is damaged. He's mentally impaired from the abuse, and no one's prosecuted. And so we petitioned the government and said, hey, look. In a case like this where the parents will not identify who was in charge of that child when the abuse happened, the parents should actually be prosecuted because the parents are in charge. They're responsible for the child. And if they won't say grandma or granddad or uncle or auntie had them, then they must be prosecuted. And the response is, oh, you can't change the law for one incident. Yeah. Well, abuse is an ongoing incident in New Zealand. We've seen it again and again. And yet they changed the firearms law within two weeks for one incident. So there's so much hypocrisy and double standards going on and they're not acting in the interest of New Zealanders. Okay, just a couple of quick things to wrap up with. If I was to describe your party in a nutshell, it seems that you're really pushing here the idea of common sense democracy. That seems to be a sort of summation of what I've heard so far. On the democratic question, um, do you have any desire around the the minimum threshold for minor parties? At the moment, they have to get 5%. Do you think that's too high? MMP, do you think it's working? Any ideas there? We had a, a Royal Commission into our electoral system and it recommended dropping the threshold. Uh, so we'd probably, if we're going to have a Royal Commission and we pay all these experts to come up with these ideas and then the government says, oh, actually, I don't like them, so you're not going to have them, why bother having a commission? Like, if you're not going to listen to them, don't bother having one, don't waste our money. Yeah. So the idea of the threshold being dropped, it does give more representation in Parliament. I know some people are scared of it because they say what happened with New Zealand First last time where Labour didn't get the majority of the votes, but he allowed them to become par- Parliament. People voted for New Zealand First. They voted for him. They chose Winnie. They gave him the tick. They trusted them, so that was their choice. So we did get the parliament we voted for because people voted for winning and Peter voted for Jacinda and that's how, who got in. So um, MMP does allow us to have a democracy. I think maybe the single transferable vote might be a better way to go, but we have chosen as a nation MMP. And we've got to work with what we've chosen because that's democracy. Yeah. But people have to understand, and I think I've been saying that this year around the place, don't vote someone out this year. Actually vote someone in. Look for people that you really want to vote in. That's the important thing. Uh, because then it's not wasted. If you and vote for what you don't truly believe, you'll get what you didn't want, and then you've wasted your vote anyway. One last question to finish with. Uh, pitch to the electorate, if you like. Why should people vote for you, Leighton? Why should they vote for the New Conservatives? New Conservatives are just a broad range of New Zealanders. We're practical, hard-working Kiwis that love New Zealand. And we simply want to represent the people that vote for us. We want to uphold family values. And we look at, want to look at the practical things that we can do as a nation going forward to retain the fantastic nation we've had previously. We believe the government's going down the wrong track. It wants more government control. We believe less government control and a focus on families because families give us the safeguard for all of us to grow and develop. So a vote for New Conservative is a vote for democracy. It's a vote for families and it's a vote for justice. If those things are important for you, vote for us. Um, but if you vote for your wallet, don't be disappointed if you don't get what you really want. The head of the New Conservative Party, Leighton Baker, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us and uh, good luck in the upcoming election. Brilliant. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Really do appreciate that. And uh, we'll have to catch up for coffee sometime since we live so close. <laughs> yeah, we're just down the road. I know we will. Or even a beer, hey. perhaps, if it's not illegal. Hey. Okay. <laughs> but not a joint. Okay. Thanks, Leighton. Yes. Bye bye. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side our fears are done All the good times just begun Oh, we know what we have, let's hold on tight 
found what we're looking for in life Call us crazy but things are finally right With you and I the future 